welcome to part two of the latest podcast from the Gold Chronicles with Jim Rickards, presented by Physical Gold Fund. Oh, thanks, Jim. Let me turn our attention for a moment to the currency wars. You've written recently about the so-called Shanghai Accord. It's a deal put together, as I understand, on the sidelines by the G20 at the end of February this year. Now, it seems this was an attempt to help China devalue the yuan without panicking the world's stock markets. Could you tell us about the Shanghai Accord and what it means for the currency wars? I'd be glad to. It's one of my favorite topics, uh, and I've been writing and speaking quite a bit about it. I'll be uh, speaking uh, to an investor conference here in uh, Carlsbad, uh, California. That's where I'm coming uh, coming from to the audience right now uh, on, in a couple hours on this. So on February 26th, there was a G20 meeting in Shanghai, China, and the, the G20 operates at several levels. They have what they call the Leaders Summit. That's where... Uh, you know, President Obama and and uh, President Xi of China and Angela Merkel, Chancellor of Germany, the the actual heads of state or leaders, as the case may be, would show up. That's that's happening in Huangzhou, China, on September fourth. So that's a few months away. But they have uh, meetings throughout the year for the central bankers and finance ministers and what they call Sherpas, who are technical experts who brief the central bankers, etc. On February twenty sixth in Shanghai, China, was the G twenty central bank and finance ministers meeting and they have a formal agenda and a final communique and that's all publicly available but the real action at these meetings is on the sidelines uh, private dinners uh, private conferences um, you know maybe a chat in the back seat of a limo etc in fact I just uh, I'm in California now but I just arrived here last night from uh, Washington DC where I was at the IMF spring meetings and the IMF you know International Monetary Fund they have two big meetings a year one in the fall one in the spring this was their spring meeting and the G20 meet on the sidelines of the IMF. So the IMF is almost uh, sort of a clubhouse or a platform for the G20. Interestingly, the G20, by the way, for those who don't know, the G20 is, G stands for group. So G20 is a group of 20 nations that includes the major developed economies. So the United States, Germany, France, Italy, UK, Australia, uh, Canada, and some others but also includes the major emerging markets for developing economies. So all the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, and some others, uh, Argentina. And the funny thing is it's not quite the G20. I, I call it the G20 and friends because they usually invite a couple other nations to join them. So it's kind of like a floating G23 or G24, but they call it the G20. They're really running the world right now. They are the board of directors of the international monetary system, but they don't have any permanent secretariat or permanent staff. And so they use the IMF as their platform. So the G20 meets, but then they turn to the IMF and say, look, we need you to do this research. We need you to do this policy. We need you to do this program, et cetera. And they work hand in glove. So the, G the IMF spring meeting this week, uh, which I just left, includes uh, G20 meetings on the sidelines. In fact, tomorrow, Saturday, there's going to be a G20 a press conference, probably uh, uh, worth a look. But the February 26th meeting in Shanghai was central banks and finance ministers only. And they cooked up what I call the Shanghai Accord, and that's sort of a reference back to the Plaza Accord. And for Currency Wars fans and uh, aficionados of the international monetary system, the Plaza Accord was a 1985 meeting that took place at the Plaza Hotel in New York, hence the name, uh, designed to weaken the dollar. What had happened is, you go back to 1977, uh, the dollar was so weak uh, and nobody wanted them that the United States Treasury, believe it or not, issued treasury bonds denominated in Swiss francs. Uh, can you imagine that? Nobody wanted dollars. And so the Treasury had to borrow money in Swiss francs because people say, yeah, I'll, I'll trust the Swiss franc. I, I don't want your cheesy dollars. That's how bad things were in 77. By 1981, things had completely reversed. This was the uh, era of king dollar uh, orchestrated by Paul Volcker and Ronald Reagan. Paul Volcker said, okay, we're going to defend the dollar, whatever it takes. Right? He took interest rates to 20%. He said, uh, you don't want dollars at you know 10%, how about 11? How about 12? How about 13? How about 15? How about 16? 18? Now, notice he kept going until he got to an interest rate where people said, yeah, I'll take some dollars at 20%, uh, bring, you know, bring it on. You know, in 1980, you could buy 30-year treasury bonds that yielded 15%. Can you imagine if you had gone out and bought a 30-year treasury bond in 1980, from 1980 to 2010, 
30 years, you would have had a 15% annual return in a treasury bond. We're not talking about junk bonds here. That's, uh, you know, this, some smart people did that, but that's that's how bad things were. But Volcker turned it around, and then, of course, Reagan cut taxes, um, cut regulation. Uh, the U.S. economy took off like a rocket. Well, mission accomplished. You know, the dollar completely turned around from the lows of 77 to an all-time high. All-time high for the dollar on major indices was 1985. But by then, uh, James Baker was uh, the Secretary of the Treasury, and the dollar was too strong. It was killing exports, killing corporate earnings, etc. So he convened that. Then it was the G7. I mean, the emerging markets in 1985 were not on the radar screen. China was, um, you know, had potential, but uh, you know, Russia was still under communism. That didn't end until 1990, and, and so forth. And so it was the G7, really the European countries, Canada, the U.S., and Japan. And they orchestrated a decline in the dollar, and it worked. It was coordinated foreign currency market intervention by the major central banks to weaken the dollar, and it worked because they felt the dollar was too strong. Flash forward to uh, 2016, something very similar happened in uh, Shanghai. So I call it the Shanghai Accord, again, a reference back to the Plaza Accord. Now, before I get to the solution, and I'll, I'll do that uh, in a minute, I want to describe the problem. I was, what, what problem were they trying to solve? Well, the Chinese economy is coming in for hard landing. I mean, the evidence is, is everywhere. I don't want to turn this into a presentation on uh, China economics, but I think you, know, you saw the GDP last night continues to decline, but it's worse than that. They've got for the first time a serious uh, employment problem, or I should say unemployment problem. So GDP is not the main event. The main event is jobs, 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 uh, because they're communists. I mean, communists, what legitimacy do they have? Uh, well, the answer is none, but if they can create jobs, then people will go along with the system. But the minute the job machine starts to stall, people become discontented. They lose what's called the uh, the mandate of heaven. That's a thousands-year-old Chinese concept. Even communists can lose the mandate of heaven. So. So things are pretty bad over there. It looks like they are coming in for hard landing. They're the second largest economy in the world. If China goes down, they take the world with it. That was already happening. So China needed some relief in the currency wars by cheapening the currency. But the last two times China tried to cheapen the currency, they sank the U.S. stock markets. We came very close to a global financial panic and meltdown of the order of magnitude of 2008. What were these incidents? Well, August 11th, 2015, China did this shock devaluation 3% overnight. What happened between August 11th and August 31st, 2015, last summer? The U.S. stock market sank like a stone. It crashed. Um, and in, on, by August 31st, just ask yourself, ask yourself where you were on August 31st, 2015. You know, maybe on vacation, uh, maybe taking the kids back to college. Could have been doing a lot of things, but we were staring into the abyss. Remember how scary it was? That's what happened when uh, that was the reaction of the U.S. stock market to the Chinese devaluation. Now, the Fed came out. They had originally hoped to raise rates in September. They decided not to raise rates in September. They started the happy talk and the, uh, you know, the dovish talk, and that turned things around. And the market said, okay, they're not raising after all. And markets rallied. The market came back. But that was a very scary episode. Okay, the next time China tried to devalue, they did it. They didn't do the overnight three percent thing. They did it in baby steps um, in December and early January, uh, December 2015, early January 2016. What happened? The U.S. stock market crashed again from January 1st, 2016, to February 11th, 2016. We had a full-blown correction, down 10 percent. Again, it looked like we were staring into the abyss. And again, the Fed came to the rescue with happy talk, and Dudley gave a speech, and uh, the Fed made it clear they weren't going to raise rates in March, even though the market had expected it to, et cetera, and the market came back. But you had two kind of death-defying plunges of the stock market roller coaster in response to two Chinese efforts at devaluation. So the problem was China needed to devalue to boost their economy, but it devalued the U.S. stock market sank. So how could China devalue without sinking the U.S. stock markets? That was the problem. So what they came up with is a, is a very clever finesse, and it, it turns on the fact that there are more currencies in the world than the Chinese yuan and the U.S. dollar. Now, everyone focuses obsessively on the cross rate uh, between the Chinese yuan and the U.S. dollar. The, the ticker symbols are, or the trading symbols CNY slash USD, that's Chinese yuan, U.S. dollar. People focus obsessively on that rate, on that cross rate, and when the yuan goes down against the dollar, U.S. stock markets crashed. So what they said is, well, let's do the following. Instead of the Chinese doing anything, let's have the Chinese do nothing, and let's strengthen the euro, strengthen the yen, 
and weaken the dollar, but keep the yuan dollar cross rate unchanged. That way, nobody would notice. Now, Europe and Japan together have a larger trading relationship with China than the U.S. In other words, if you could cheapen the yuan against the euro and the yen, arguably you would get more relief than cheapening against the dollar. And furthermore, if you could cheapen the dollar and maintain the peg, China would be along for the ride. In other words, you would get a weaker yuan without changing the cross rate because the dollar itself was getting weaker. So the playbook was strengthen the euro, strengthen the yen, cheapen the dollar. China do nothing. No one notices. The cross rate's unchanged, but China gets a major devaluation. That is exactly what happened. So following, so I mentioned this meeting was February 26th. So what was, what was the, um, the timeline or sequence of events? Literally in a matter of days. On March 10th, Draghi tightened European policy. Now, People say, wait a second, he cut, he, he pushed interest rates 10 basis points further into negative territory and did 10 billion more of Euro QE. How is that tightening? Well, the answer is that's exactly what the market expected. In fact, that was the low end of what the market expected. The market was expecting 10 and 10, 10 billion of more QE and, and 10 basis points of more negative rates. So that was already priced in. But then Draghi shocked the markets by saying, I'm done. And as I'm doing 10 and 10, but I'm not doing any more. That was not expected. And the way central banks manipulate behavior these days is not really by changing anything, but by, by changing, uh, not by changing rates or, or QE, but by changing policy relative to expectations. In other words, if expectations are for more ease and you say no more ease, then that's tightening relative to expectations. And that's what Draghi did. Four days later, Kuroda comes out. He's the governor of the Bank of Japan. People expected more easing. Didn't get it. He didn't He didn't tighten. It's not like he reduced the money supply, but they were expecting him to increase the money supply. And he said no. So that's tightening relative to expectations. So you have a tighter, Euro, tighter European policy. The euro went up. Tighter Japanese policy. The yen went up. Then March 16th, it's Yellen's turn. The Fed did not raise rates, and, but the markets expected that. But then she gave a very dovish press conference, and the market said, huh, it looks like you're not going to raise rates for a long time. That's called forward guidance. And then, come ahead to March 29th, Yellen gives a speech to the Economic Club of New York, which is full dove. I mean, she sprouted wings. She was flying around the room like a dove. Uh, completely reversed her position from 2015, where she had fought with Char Charlie Evans. Uh, Charlie's the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. Uh, Evans was the author of the asymmetric theory, which said that, look, we don't really know what we're doing, which is a pretty honest evaluation. I've spoken to Fed, a lot of Fed insiders, and privately they say that. We don't know what we're doing. Uh, well, this is just an experiment. But Evans said, like, we don't know what we're doing, but the risks are asymmetric. In other words, if we don't raise rates and we're wrong, it's easy to raise them in the future. In other words, if we get a little inflation, we know how to stuff, we know how to snuff out inflation. But if we do raise rates and we're wrong and we create deflation, we don't know how to cure that. And as we know how to fix inflation, but we don't know how to fix deflation. Therefore, if we do nothing and we're wrong, we can fix it. But if we raise rates and we're wrong, we can't fix it. Therefore, the risks are asymmetric in favor of doing nothing. And, he's, and Yellen fought him. Uh, intellectually, all of 2015, Ye Yellen's position was, no, I'm looking at the Phillips curve. Uh, when labor markets get tight, inflation's right around the corner. Monetary policy acts with a lag. We have to look over the horizon. We don't want to be behind the curve. You know, uh, I want to raise rates. Uh, there's another concept called NIRU, non-accelerating inflation uh, rate of unemployment, et cetera. So she was using her models to say you're supposed to raise rates. Evans was using a very uh, sophisticated but easy to understand uh, risk model that said, you shouldn't raise rates. And they fought all year. Well, all of a sudden, on March 29th, Yellen adopts Evans' position. Actually used the word asymmetric in the speech and, and gives him a footnote. So at least she gives him some intellectual credit. But so, so Yellen goes full, full dove, full Evans, and the dollar just crashes. And the yen is screaming. The yen's going up. The euro's going up. The dollar's going down. Now, the whole time, China maintained the peg to the dollar, right? But with the dollar going down and the euro going up and the yen going up, what's happening to the yuan? It's, it's devaluing. It's depreciating a lot. So this was a great finesse. China got the devaluation and nobody noticed. And U.S. stock markets did not crash. So this is the Shanghai Accord. Now, the significance of it is that this is going to continue. This is a major shift in the currency wars. And when these things happen, they, they're not day trades. I mean, they go on for a couple of years, two or three years. We had the weak yen from uh, December, began December 2012, that's when they announced Abenomics, and a weekend was one of the three hours of Abenomics, and that lasted until 
uh, March uh, 2016. So that was uh, three and a half years, so well, not, uh, not quite three and a half years of weak yen. Uh, the weak euro started in June 2014 with uh, negative interest rates and then got a boost in January 2015 with Euro QE. So that's almost two years of weak euro. So you had three years of weak yen, two years of weak euro. Now that's turned around, right? We're going to the strong euro, the strong yen. This is what currency wars are all about. They don't have any logical conclusion. They just go back and forth and back and forth. It's like two kids on a seesaw, one's up and one's down, and then they push, and then the, other, the one who was down goes up, and the one who was up goes down. But they can't go anywhere. They can only go up and down. And that's the thing with currencies. They don't, they don't go to zero until, until you end up like Zimbabwe, which we're probably heading for, but we're not there yet. But meanwhile, they just go back and forth and back and forth. So we can see the yen going to uh, 100. We can see the euro going to $1.20. And we're in for a period of weak dollars. Weak dollars phase is going to persist. Now, what does that have to do with gold? It has a lot to do with gold because what was the all-time high for gold? It was August 2011, $1,900 an ounce. August 2011 was also the all-time low for the dollar. Going, I said that January um, uh, or so early 1985 was the all-time high, and that gave rise to the Plaza Accord. But August 2011 was the all-time low. It's no coincidence that gold hit a, an all-time high in dollar space the same month that the dollar hit an all-time low on the index. I mean, after all, the dollar price of gold is just the reciprocal of the dollar. If you have a weak dollar, you have a high dollar price for gold, and if you have a strong dollar, you have a low dollar price for gold. Well, if we're at a stage where the dollar is peaked, which we are, and the dollar is going to get weaker, which it is, which I just explained uh, because of the Shanghai Accord, then that means the dollar price of gold is going to go way up. So this is an excellent technical setup for, uh, for gold. Uh, there are some physical shortages as well. My advice to investors is uh, get your gold now. Don't don't wait until it starts to scream because you may go out at that point to get gold and find that you can't find it. Thanks, Jim, for a very full answer to that question. And now over to you, Alex, and what questions do you have today from our listeners? Thanks a lot, John. I appreciate that. And just a couple of quick comments. Um, first of all, Jim, that discussion that uh, we just had a little while ago about uh, physics and chemistry reasons as to why gold makes sense as money. I've been in this industry, and when I say this industry, I mean the physical gold industry, for approaching uh, a decade now. And that is perhaps the best explanation of that that I think I have ever heard. So thank you for, for that. Secondly, we have someone asking about the audiobook version. And as you have already mentioned, it's available on Amazon. Uh, pretty exciting. I, I, I ordered that myself and I'm looking forward to listening to that on the plane. I'm, I'm coming over to New York next week for the, for the book launch celebration. And I'm going to probably be listening to it on the plane. Third... There's a question coming in about the PGF version of the book, uh, and this is coming from CM, and the question is, will the uh, Physical Gold Fund version be the same as the Strategic Intelligence version? And the answer is no. The Physical Gold Fund version is going to be unique in that it's going to contain material from myself uh, and a unique entry from Jim. Next... And here we're getting into the meat of the questions here. Uh, by the way, for those of you who are submitting questions, we're very thankful for your questions always. You can send them by email to info at physicalgoldfund.com. You can ask them directly live on the webinar if you like. You can uh, also use Twitter with the uh, hashtag AskJimRickards. If you're going to send them by email, try to, try to send them a couple of days early so that we can properly sort through these. But this first one is coming in live. This is from Elizabeth M. And question, Jim, is as you may know or as you may have heard, uh, Deutsche Bank has agreed to settle the uh, the lawsuit against them for uh, silver rigging the silver benchmark along with a couple of other banks. Do you have any comment on this bank silver rigging settlement and what impact do you think this might have on prices in the short and long term? It's very newsworthy. It's an important admission. I don't think by itself it's going to have a big impact on prices, and let, let me explain why. First of all, there's no doubt that the gold and silver markets are being manipulated. Uh, I talk about this in the book, The New Case for Gold. I explain how and why it's done, who's behind it, etc. So th there is absolutely manipulation going on. But this particular manipulation that uh, Deutsche Bank admitted to is not – the same manipulation that I describe in the book is what I'm focused on are really sovereign nations like China, the United States, you know, occasionally slamming the market and manipulating the price lower 
for geostrategic reasons. I mean, look, China is out to acquire 3,000 more tons of gold. That's almost 10% of all the official gold in the world. That, that's a huge amount. Anyone who's been involved at all, and I know you have, uh, uh, Alex, with, with the physical side of the gold market, know that you know, good luck buying 100 pounds of gold, let alone uh, 3,000 tons, which is what we're talking about. So China has a big interest in keeping the gold price low because they're still buying. If you were buying, you would want a low price also. Ultimately, the price would go much higher. But in the short run, they want to keep it under control so they can they can keep buying uh, behind the scenes. But the kind of manipulation Deutsche Bank did, this was really just front-running. It was just good old-fashioned, you know, stealing from your customers, which banks are very good at, as we know. So, uh, you know, I'm sitting there, and I'm on the phone, and we're, we're fixing the price of uh, gold or silver, this, the particular case was a silver case, and I know what my customer order book is, and I know what the wholesale market is, and I, you know, I buy some for myself, bid up the price, and then I fill all my customer orders at the higher price, and, I, and then I dump my own silver at a higher price and make a quick arbitrage profit. Uh, this is not about you know stockpiling gold and cornering the market or uh, the kinds of things that a lot of commentators dwell on, you know, ad nauseum. And by the way, I'm not saying that it doesn't go on in silver, but it's much less important than what goes on in the gold market. So, yeah, I'm glad that justice was done. I'm glad that Deutsche Bank paid a fine. I think it's illuminating about the lack of ethics by banks, one more reason to have physical gold and not not rely on the banking system. So it is a good development. But, you know, it was kind of known a year ago, and it takes a year to settle these cases. Of course, they always settle them on Fridays because they figure everyone's getting away early for vacation or whatever. So um, I don't think it's that big a deal. It's not, it's not as if it's the end of some big conspiracy. Uh, that the, the conspiracy still lives. And uh, it, as I say, this is more of a front-running case, kind of small potatoes. So I'm glad it happened, but I don't think it's going to have that big uh, an impact on the price. I happen to agree with you from our view. While they may be able to impact the price kind of on a, on a short-term basis, the overall forces in the market that we're looking at moving forward are absolutely tremendous. And I don't think that uh, any bank is going to be able to stand in the way of that. It's going to be kind of like trying to stand on a railroad track stopping a freight train uh, if, if they attempt to. So the next question, this one's coming in by email. This is coming from Chris S. This question may also apply. This person is, is Canadian, so they're asking it from a Canadian perspective, but the question may also apply to citizens of any country uh, who has very little gold. So his question is kind of a two-part question. The first is, how exposed are Canadians to the future of money of the monetary reset considering the Bank of Canada has no more gold? And in light of this, should can Canadians consider allocating more than 10% of gold in their portfolio? Yeah, I would separate the, the status of countries relative to official gold from the investment or allocation decisions of individuals with regard to their specific portfolio. So so I stick to the 10%. Now, now look, I want to make it clear. That's a judgment. You know, I write about this. I talk about this all the time, and I take my responsibility seriously. Uh, if I say something or recommend something, and people follow it. I, I may not know who they are, but I, I really take it to heart. I would not be able to sleep at night if I thought I was proposing something and uh, somebody was hurt or disadvantaged by it. So we all know that gold can go down. It goes up and down. And I could give you some scenarios where it could go down a lot, but that's the origin of the 10% uh, allocation, which is, you know, if, if you have 10% of your portfolio in gold, and it goes down 20%, which I don't expect, but just say it does, right? And it goes down 20%. The portfolio impact is 2%. In other words, it's, it's 20% of 10% is 2% of your entire portfolio. So with a 10% allocation and a 20% crash, you're going to take a 2% hit on your portfolio. 2% is not going to – no one's going to get hurt by that because uh, it also probably means that other things are going up, so your portfolio is just fine. But if you put 100% in gold – and it goes down 20%. Now you've lost 20% of your wealth. That's what happened to people who were in stocks in 2008. They lost 50% of their wealth because that's how much the markets went down. So a lot of commentators and bloggers and uh, candidly trolls uh, love to put words in your mouth, and they say things like, you know, Jim Rickards says sell everything and buy gold, and look, you know, look what happens. And all that. I've never said that. I don't recommend that. That's, that's why I stick with my 10%. Because if I'm wrong, nobody's going to get hurt badly. And if I'm right, it's going to go up 
two, three, four times, and you're going to make a significant amount of money that is your insurance on what else is happening in your portfolio, which may not be good depending on your allocation. So that's where I get the 10%. But having said that, it's a judgment. It's subjective. Uh, there's no iron law of allocation. I have clients who have 50% of their assets in gold. And I tease them. I said, look, you didn't get that from me, but you know, it's a free country. If that's your comfort level, then good for you. And by the way, some of these clients are very wealthy, so it's not as if they, uh, you know, they're not hardship cases, so to speak. So I leave it to each individual. I respect individual's allocations, but to the extent I'm going to recommend anything, I stick with the 10% because uh, that's the level where I, I know investors will do well when the price skyrockets and I know they won't get hurt if it goes the other way. So I would stick with that whether you live in Canada, Switzerland, U.S., Singapore. Now, as far as Canada is concerned, there, it's an interesting case. It's kind of a little nutty, which is officially they have no gold. I, I read one report they were down to 77 ounces, which, uh, you know, I know lots of people have kind of keep that much in a desk drawer. I mean, that's not a lot of, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's $100,000 of current prices. It's not uh, pin money, but uh, it's not as if we're talking about billions of dollars here. But uh, so Canada essentially has no gold officially. But they are one of the five largest gold producers in the world, meaning the private sector in Canada produces uh, approximately 200 tons a year, which is a significant amount of, of all the gold that's produced in the year, which is a little over 2,000 tons. And they've got lots of gold reserves in the ground. So I guess the government of Canada could always expropriate that. They could always seize it if they ever needed the gold. But the, to me, the real impact of it is that when the... Um, when the global monetary system, when the international monetary system collapses, which I do expect, and by the way, that's not some you know out of the blue dire forecast. It has collapsed you know several times, three times in the last hundred years. So these collapses do happen every 30, 40 years. And the major uh, powers have to sit down around a table and reform the system. Canada is not going to have a seat. It's going to be like one of those boardrooms where the, the powerful directors sit at the table and then the the minions kind of sit against the wall, little chairs. Canada's going to be against the wall. The people at the table are going to be the United States with 8,000 tons, uh, Europe led by Germany with 10,000 tons, Russia with now approaching 2,000 tons, you know, France, Italy, 2,000 tons each. Uh, that, that would be included in the European 10,000 tons. China with some number uh, we have to estimate, but probably 4,000 tons, maybe a lot higher uh, when all is said and done. So they're going to have the seats at the table. And countries like the UK, Canada, uh, Australia, many others, Brazil, they're going to be sitting against the wall. So uh, it, it just means Canada will be tagged along with the U.S. Uh, they're going to have to rely on the U.S. to cut a good deal. But, of course, the U.S. will cut a good deal for the U.S. may or may not be a good deal for Canada. But uh, Canada's just not going to have a seat at the table. But it doesn't – Canada's official weakness doesn't change my view as to what individuals should do. Okay, very good. I think a lot of people are going to appreciate that uh, that answer, Jim. Okay, moving on. Uh, the next question – actually, this is a comment. This is coming in from Chris M. Just to let you know, Mr. Rickards, I just ordered your book from Amazon. So <laughs> thanks, Chris. Chris M., I, I thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we have another question. In fact, I think this would, is going to be the last question because we're running out of time here. But this is coming in from HBK Bangalore, and the question is, China is about to launch a yuan-denominated gold fix. What do you think the impact uh, this is going to have on the physical supply-demand scenario? I think it's a very big deal. By itself, is that the end of the U.S. dollar? No. I mean, that, that story has some ways to run. But it's part – there are many, many developments around the world, and this is one of them. It's not the only one. But you know, when I look at Russia's acquisition of gold, China's acquisition of gold, the creation of a new – even the physical gold standard. And Alex, you know this very well, and you, you and I have been to Switzerland, and we've been involved, and so we've – you know, hefted those uh, those 400 ounce gold bars in our hands. They're very they're beautiful to look at, but they're, they're heavy. I mean, they actually it's like lifting a 35 pound free weight. But uh, uh, China has changed the standard for what physical gold is. Uh, prior to China's emergence, it was a 400 ounce good delivery bar of 99 uh, percent or 99.9 .9 percent purity. The new Chinese standard is a one kilo bar, so 2.2 uh, pounds instead of 35 pounds, so a, a smaller, but in that sense more mobile and maybe more practical, of four nines quality, 99.99% pure. A lot of the refining in Switzerland today consists of taking these old 400-ounce bars, 
uh, two nine quality, melting them down and turning them into one kilo bars of four nine quantities or quality rather. So that's the new gold standard. Now China's taking that several steps further with a, a physical gold exchange, a gold futures exchange, and now going all the way to nominating it in, in yuan. So where does that go? Well, the next step would be the yuan and the SDR become benchmark currencies uh, for gold, not the dollar. And now if you want to manipulate the gold market, where do you go? You need to go to New York, to go to Shanghai, to go to London. Uh, it just gets more and more difficult to use the dollar and to use a single market, namely the COMEX closing price, every day to to manipulate markets. So, the you know this is like uh, the, the more exchanges, the more venues, the more currencies, and the more uh, standards you have, it gets to be like herding cats. Uh, the cats run in all different directions, and they don't listen to you. I'm a, a, cat owner. Uh, so, uh, so I know a little bit about that. And, and that's what's happening. Uh, and it's all part of uh, China understanding that uh, gold is money, which is where we started the podcast. Gold is money. If you want to control money, you need to control gold. And they're taking very large steps in that direction. So I, I think it's a very important development. By itself, is it the end of the dollar? No but it's a big step in that direction. Outstanding. Thanks a lot, Jim. And with that, I think that wraps up our time for today. We want to thank everybody for their questions. We're going to be doing an all Q&A webinar the next time around. That's coming up in May. And John's got some more details for you all on that. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to John Ward. Thank you, Alex. Uh, we've heard from you that you'd like that, uh, listeners, that you'd like to do more Q&A with Jim. So we've set aside our next podcast in May, which we've got scheduled now. It'll be on the 18th of May. And uh, we'd love to have your questions. Now, to make the most of this, we'd really like to invite you to send your questions in advance. And that means in advance, not you know the day before. So as Alex mentioned, you can email us at info at physicalgoldfund.com. That's info at physicalgoldfund.com. And we'd like to give the session a bit of a focus. So we're especially looking for your questions that arise from Jim's latest book, The New Case for Gold. So grab a copy and send us your questions at info at physicalgoldfund.com. So now let me say thank you to you, Jim Rickards. It's really another extraordinary uh, conversation with you today, and it's always a pleasure and an education having you with us. And most of all, thank you to our listeners for spending time with us today. Let me encourage you to follow Jim on Twitter. His handle is at James G. Rickards. So goodbye for now, and we look forward to joining you again soon. You've been listening to part two of the latest podcasts from the Gold Chronicles with Jim Ricketts, presented by Physical Gold Fund. <laughs>